Well, our scripture lessons this morning, neither of which are in your bulletin, is first from Psalm 8 and then from Romans chapter 1. So we'll begin with Psalm 8 at the beginning. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. For when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hand. You have put all things under his feet. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then from the book of Romans, when Paul begins to talk about what we can learn from just looking at the world around us, beginning Romans 1, chapter, uh, sorry, verse 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from the heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, over the years, there have been many approaches by Christians to deal with people who reject anything to do with faith and accept only what they would call science. And forgive me uh, for being, uh, uh, giving, giving into my sort of... Uh, humorous side this morning, but one favorite example of this for me has came from the actor Jack Black in his movie Nacho Libre. Black is a Mexican priest of a failing parish and tries with, with the help of his atheist friend to raise money for the parish by becoming Lucha Libre wrestlers. But Jack discovers that they are slated to wrestle a notorious duo, Satan's cavemen, and he gets worried about his friend's salvation and he comes up with a unique solution. I'm a little concerned right now about your salvation and stuff. How come you have not been baptized? Because I never got around to it, okay? I don't know why you always have to be judging me. Because I only believe in science. But tonight, we are going up against Satan's caveman. And I just thought it would be a good idea if you... <laughs> Felicita. Now, in our short series on the state of theology, I distributed a uh, a, the survey questions to a number of people, asked them which of the questions they'd want me to preach on. I have to say, almost everyone chose question 18, which is um, basically, you know, mo the, the statement is, modern science disproves the Bible. And, and the survey results are interesting. Even for the general public, 48% of people disagree with the statement. Only 40% actually agree. So the so view that's not quite as widespread as you might think. Among evangelical Christians, I do find it odd that 21% agree and 11% are unsure. Now, if I was a Christian and I thought the primary source of my faith had been disproved, I don't know that I would stick with it. And when you look at the data, almost a third of evangelical Christians either believe the Bible has been disproved or are unsure of that. And, and, and you know, that's a problem. The debates between science and religion are often in the public spotlight, and have been for many years. And, and you know that the main way that they are portrayed in the media is to pit the enlightened, intelligent scientist against the dim-witted, humorless Bible thumper. And we see that, and we don't want to be that person. And uh, Yeah, it does cause some consternation for us. I remember when I was a kid watching the great movie Inherit the Wind. You know, had, had to catch it on television because I missed it in the theaters. And you couldn't just, you know, rent a DVD or watch it online. It was a fairly faithful production of a play of the same name. 
and it recounts the trial of John Scopes in 1925, who was accused of teaching evolution at a Tennessee high school at a time when it was illegal. Honestly, let me tell you, watching the movie made me feel that my suspicions and misgivings about religion were real and justified, and that frankly, Christians were just dumb. I was that guy who just believed in science. The trial itself was made more famous by the people it attracted. The prosecution was led by William Jennings Bryan, a nationally known politician, well-liked populist, and a great order. Also a Presbyterian elder who was very active in the life of the church and had a great deal of knowledge of the Bible. He was opposed by a nationally known defense attorney, uh, Clarence Darrow, who'd been hired by the ACLU. And the trial was turned into a media circus by one of the best-known sensational journalists of the day, H.L. Mencken. I want to play you a clip from the movie. Um, Spencer Tracy, it's a great cast, is Clarence Darrow figure. He's named Henry Drummond in, in the movie. Uh, Frederick March plays Brian, named Matthew Brady in the play. Let me show you about four minutes of it here. As, uh, as Brady um, is... Uh, uh, is um, has Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, as, as Spencer Tracy gets Frederick March on the stand and, and is interrogate him about the Bible. Colonel Brady. Oh, no, 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 it won't be necessary to swear him in. Oh, I can make affirmation. I have no objection to swearing to God. <laughs> no, uh, I take it you will tell the truth. Uh, now, sir, I, I, I am right in calling upon you as uh, an authority on, on the Bible, am I not? I believe it is not boastful to say that I have studied the Bible as much as any layman, and I have tried to live according to its precepts. Bully for you. Now, I suppose you can quote me chapter and verse right straight through the King James Version. There are many portions of the Holy Bible that I have committed to memory. I don't suppose there are many portions of this book you've committed to memory. The origin of the species. I am not the least interested in the pagan hypotheses of that book. Never read it. And I never will. Then how in perdition have you got the gall to whoop up this holy war about something that you don't know anything about? How can you be so cocksure that the body of scientific knowledge systematized in the writings of Charles Darwin is in any way irreconcilable with the book of Genesis? Would you state that question again, please? Yeah. All right. Forget it. We'll play in your ballpark, Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, uh, there, I'd like to get this part clear first. There, this is the book. This is the book that uh, you're an authority on, isn't it? That is correct. You believe that, that every word written in this book should be taken literally? Everything in the Bible should be accepted exactly as it is given there. Now, I recollect a, a story about Joshua. Uh, Joshua making the sun stand still. Uh, as an expert, do you uh, tell me that that's uh, as right as the Jonah business? That's a pretty neat trick. I do not question or scoff at the miracles of the Lord, as do ye of little faith. Have you ever pondered what would actually happen to the earth if the sun stood still? You can testify to that if I get you on the stand. <laughs> <laughs> if, as they say, the sun stood still, they must have had some kind of an idea that, uh, that the sun moved around the earth. Do you think that's the way of things? Or don't you believe that the earth moves around the sun? I have faith in the Bible. You don't have much faith in the solar system. The sun stopped. Good. Now... If what you say actually happened, if Joshua stopped the sun in the sky, the earth stopped spinning on its axis. Continents toppled over one another, mountains flew into space, and the earth, shriveled to a cinder, crashed into the sun. Now, how come they missed that little tidbit of news? They missed it because it didn't happen. But it had to happen. It must have happened according to natural law. Or don't you believe in natural law, Mr. Brady? Would you, would you ban Copernicus from the classroom along with Charles Darwin? Would you pass a law throwing out all scientific knowledge since Joshua? Revelations, period? Natural law was born in the mind of the Heavenly Father. He can change it, cancel it, use it as he pleases. Looks pretty bad for the Christian there, doesn't it? And you know, this is pretty much how the normal debate uh, and the depiction of the science-religion debate goes. 
the smart, intelligent, modern advocate of science, is opposed by the narrow-minded, ignorant Bible thumper who clings to a hopeless position. Let me tell you, friends, it's interesting how different things often are in real life, even in 1925. In reality, it was Brian who had read Darwin's On the Origin of Species some 20 years before the Scopes trial and had engaged in a running debate about the book with Henry Fairfield Osborne, the president of the American Museum of Natural History. Darrow had tried to read the book, but he couldn't comprehend it, and he never got past page 50. Far from being some flaming conservative, Brian was a three-time presidential candidate for the Democratic Party, a two-time congressman, the Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson, and a driving force between four different constitutional amendments, including women's suffrage, as well as one of the most influential proponents for the establishment of the Federal Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. That's the reality. And how often have you seen the science versus religion debate portrayed by the smart person being the religious guy and the slightly dense person being the one that supports science? It's always supposed to be the other way around, right? Nor was Brian a thoughtless biblical literate that he was portrayed. Let me give you some actual examples of the trial record uh, as Darrow examined Brian on his thing. Darrow, do you claim everything in the Bible should be interpreted literally? Brian, I believe everything in the Bible should be accepted as it is given there. Some of the Bible is given illustratively. For instance, uh, you are the salt of the earth. I would not insist that a man actually uh, was salt or that he had salt as flesh, but it is used in the sense of salt saving God's people. And then later, Darrow, would you say that the earth was only 4,000 years old? Brian, oh no, much older than that. How much? I, I couldn't say. Uh, uh, do you say that the Bible itself says it's older than that? It says, I don't think the Bible says uh, itself whether it is older or not. Do you think the earth was made in six days? Not six 24-hour days. All right, does the statement the morning and the evening were the first day and the morning and evening were the second day mean anything to you? I do not think it necessarily means a 24-hour day. You do not know. Well, what do you consider it to be? I've not attempted to explain it. If you will take the second chapter, and let me have the book. Fourth verse, second chapter says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And when they were created in the day, the Lord made the day, the heavens and the earth. The word day is there in the very next chapter, used to describe a period. I do not see that there is any necessity in construing the words the evening and the morning as meaning necessarily a 24-hour day in the day when the Lord made the heavens and the earth. So the reality was completely different than what the debate is portrayed, and I think that's pretty common. Now, to be honest, I want to tell you that I think Christians are also a part of the problem. We read something in the Bible that has happened as a result of the actions of a being that is outside the created order, unbound by natural laws and the universe, laws that that being created. And we then sometimes expect modern science to somehow confirm that biblical event of truth. And in doing so, we're honestly asking science to do something that's beyond what it is created to do. Let me give you a fairly common definition of, of science. And that is, science in the broadest sense refers to any system of knowledge obtained by verifiable means. In a more restricted sense, science refers to a system of acquiring knowledge based on empiricism, experimentation, and methodological naturalism, as well, uh, well as to the organized body of knowledge humans have gained by such research. Now, friends, let me ask you this. Do any of you think that anything that God has done or God can be measured sci by scientifically verified means? You know, can we, with observations, experiments, and measurements, prove uh, anything God does? And I think the answer is no. We ask science to accept something that it cannot see, measure, or understand, or replicate. And, and, and basically, when we do that, we ask it to stop being science and becoming religion. And that's not fair to science. And to be honest, if God wanted us to be able to prove his existence or validate his actions by means other than faith, he could have made the job a whole lot easier. I think sometimes we want science to prove God's existence, and clearly that's not its job. Uh, nor something I think particularly that God wants it to do. Now, this is not to say that God's fingerprints are not on all creation. Time after time in the Bible, we read that people are made aware of the majesty of God simply by looking at the created world. 
Paul mentions this in Romans chapter 1, that just by looking at the created order, it informs you of the existence of a God and gives you some sense of the moral order of the world. And frankly, friends, every culture throughout the world that we've ever known has always believed in a creator God. And, and the bottom line is that there have been plenty of people in science who've actually come to a belief in God because of what they've learned in their studies and research. I could talk about this for hours, but you know, there's someone that we know now very well after COVID, uh, and that's Francis Collins, an American a physician geneticist noticed for his discoveries of disease genes and his leadership of the Human Genome Pro Program. He recently retired as director of the National Institutes of Health in Bethsaida, Maryland. And for years, he would have described himself as an atheist. But his work as a doctor, his research as a scientist, and the writings of C.S. Lewis have turned him into what he calls a serious Christian. He wrote a best-selling book called The Language of God, A Scientist Pretends Evidence for Faith. Let me quote you just a couple of lines from it. To get our universe, with all the potential for complexities or any kind of potential for any kind of life form, everything has to be precisely defined on the knife edge of improbability. You have to see the hands of a creator who set the parameters to be just so because the creator was interested in something a little more complicated than random particles. And let me tell you, friends, even science itself is sometimes a faith-based proposition. We're asked to believe in a material world where science has never actually found anything solid. We're asked to believe that matter uh, somehow existed eternally, that the universe was created out of nothing. And then we're told that the, the most of the mass in the universe is dark matter. And dark matter is stuff that we cannot see, cannot measure, cannot touch, or cannot explain. Now, that sounds a little more like religion to science to me. Really a perfect example of that uh, are just some of the facts that cosmologists have come up with. Cosmologists have isolated key numbers that are fundamental for our physical universe. And some of them are extremely large. For instance, a force they call N. Uh, and that's uh, a, a number that is so fractional. It's one followed by 32 zeros. Measures the strength of the electrical forces that hold the atom together, divided by the force of gravity between them. If that was off, even slightly, life couldn't exist. Others like Q are equally small, represent the ratio between two fundamental en energies. Cambridge professor and world-class astronomer Martin Reeves explained that in his book, Just Six Numbers the deep forces that shape the universe. And he says that if any one of these numbers were even fractionally different, there would be no stars, no earth, no life. And yet, you know what? He himself prefers to believe that our universe is one among a mind-boggling number, perhaps infinite number of parallel universes, each governed by different laws and defined by different numbers. The only way he can actually get his statistics to match up. Um, but, you know, ours just happens to be the, uh, amongst that infinite number, the one that sustains life. Let me tell you, friends, believing that takes more faith than I have. I love how Magletha, uh, Rebecca McLaughlin uh, observes this. She writes, I, I live a short walk from MIT, the sacred temple of scientific endeavor in the United States. Stop a student in that infinite corridor that meanders through its buildings and ask he or she if she thinks there are any Christian professors in the institute, and the answer will likely be no. Yet the roll call of Christian professors at MIT is impressive. I've already mentioned nuclear scientist Ian Hutchins, professor of aeronautics and astronomics Daniel Hastings, the electrical engineering professor uh, Jing Kong, none of whom was raised as Christian. But there are more. Artificial intelligence experts, Rosalind Picard, who invented the, the field of effective computing, became a Christian when she was a teenager. Chemistry professor Troy Van Rufus, became Christ when he was in grad school at Berkeley. Biological and mechanical engineering professor Linda Griffin became a Christian, Christian when she was already an established scientist. Other Christians include professors of mechanical and ocean engineering, Dick Yu, chemical engineering professor Chris Love, professor of biology engineering, chemical engineering and biology, Doug Blaffenberger, history professor Ann McCants, even neurosurgeon and former MIT president and the first female president of the institutes, Susan Hockfield. And the list goes on and extends far beyond MIT to leading scientists across the world. And then she summarizes with this great line, if science has disproved Christianity, no one has thought to notify them. 
So let me finish this morning with a final thought. And I know it's a bit of an uh, of a oversimplification. But to me, the answer to the faith versus science debate is basically this. It's not faith versus science. It's how versus why and who. Science tells us the how. Faith tells us the why and the who. The, and, and however important the how question is, and friends, let me tell you, there's absolutely no question as to the wonders and improvements that science and the scientific method have brought into our life. However important the how question is, I will maintain in the long run that the why question is even more important. Science can never answer why. It can give, never give meaning to our existence, never give purpose beyond random chance or the survival of the species. It is faith that tells us why, why we exist, the purpose behind our life, who it was who created us, who it is who wants to be a part of our life today and into our future. All that is beyond science reach. Friends, I know that if you are or have been a parent, you hoped you'd never get that inevitable question, how did I get here? But every day you long to answer the question, why am I here? Because the answer to that was that it was because your parents wanted someone to love and to share their life with. Psalm 8 tells us that when we look up into the heavens and are awed by the expanse and the majesty and the wonder um, and wonder if someone really matters, uh, we really matter to someone. And what's the answer? We're told that the Lord made us a little lower than the heavenly beings, crowned us with glory and honor. God made you ruler over the works of your hands. God put everything under your feet. O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And friends, no science can tell you that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that, that because of, of the foundations that you have put into our world, to our lives, that it is Western culture guided by Christianity that literally created the scientific method that brought all the wonders, modern wonders that we have into our world. And yet somehow we sometimes see that it's the enemy and it thinks that we're the enemy. And it's not. We thank you for all the things science accomplishes. Help us never to try to make it do our job for us or to replace it with a faith in you. We do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us and join us? In our last praise, be thou my vision.
friends, go out into the world for this place, knowing that all that you see proclaims the glory of God. And may his grace, his mercy, his peace, and his presence be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.